Good afternoon and uh, welcome for uh, to each one for joining us for today. We appreciate that. I'm Rick Sizemore, the former uh, director of the Wilson Workforce and Rehabilitation Center down in Fishersville, Virginia. That is a program that has benefited greatly from this VR ROI project and we're excited to be here and to participate in the session today. I'm also the executive producer of the VR Workforce Studio podcast. We podcast the Sparks that ignites vocational rehabilitation through the inspiring stories of people, business, and of course, professionals just like yourselves who are interested in vocational rehabilitation. If you would like to subscribe to our podcast, please stop by and we'll uh, give you a free subscription, get you signed up, and give you email alerts every time there is a new and exciting uh, episode. I do want to alert everyone to the fact that we are recording today's session. I think there's a video being made. We're also making an audio recording, and uh, hopefully there will be some uh, comments and some segments from today's recording on an upcoming podcast episode. So please uh, keep that in mind as you're making comments or asking asking uh, uh, questions. So, uh, time to get underway. I'm excited to be able to introduce today's panelists. Uh, we'll begin with Dr. Bob Schmidt, who is the principal investigator of the VR ROI project from the University of Richmond. He is retired and professor emeritus, so I'm excited to be sitting beside of my good friend Bob. To my right, Dr. Joe Ashley, who just finished up a celebrated vocational rehabilitation career with the Virginia Department for Aging and Rehabilitative Services, spanning more than three decades. We like to refer to him as the blind man with a vision. And actually, if you'd like to hear his story, we have an episode featuring Joe uh, on our podcast. You can see that at vrworkforcestudio.com. Another shameless plug. I apologize for that. Uh, but Joe is uh, been around with this project uh, really for the past several years and uh, now has moved out of his state VR career and uh, in the second career as a private VR consultant. We're excited to have him with us today. Also from the Virginia Department for Aging and Rehabilitative Services, Dr. Kirsten Rowe is the project coordinator and a person that's been intimately involved with uh, this project throughout the years. Also, Dr. Uh, Rob Froelich down at the uh, end of the table, who's the project director from the George Washington University and certainly a person who is affiliated and recognized as a key influencer and leader in this whole effort uh, to understand the Voc Rehab uh, Return on Investment Project. Okay, uh, you do see our session objectives if the clicker will work, and it does. You do see our session objectives up on the screen. In today's session, we hope to certainly provide a brief overview of the VR ROI project and describe the project's approach to engaging VR agencies and other stakeholders and describe some examples of the project's knowledge translation activities. So uh, there are several people who have been involved uh, with the uh, project who could not be with us today. And I'm going to ask Bob if he would uh, give a quick overview of some of the other key uh, influencers that have been involved with the project. Bob? Okay, that sounds great. I'm going to do it not quite in the order, well, in the order that's done here, but I just wanted to say one thing first, which is our, our project is fairly complicated. There are a lot of people, a lot are moving parts and we have our the people who work day to day on the thing are divided into two components one is a project management team and that's all four of us are on the project management team we talk just about weekly to you know make sure that the railroad's on time and think trains are running on time things of that sort and the, the person who couldn't be here from that group is dr McGuire, maureen mcguire coulettes who's our project liaison and she's at the george washington university the other four, the other team is our research team, and it's comprised of four PhD economists, uh, and we, we work on the technical aspects and also getting estimates and trying to interpret them for the VR community. I'm on that team as well, as are Dr. Chris 
Clapp, Christopher Clapp. He's a research, uh, senior research associate at the University of Chicago. Dr. John Pepper is a consultant. He's at the University of Virginia. He's a Merrill Bankard of, of Merrill Bankard of Merrill Bankard Professor of Economics and the Chair of the Economics Department. And Stephen Cern, who's in the off audience, is at Stony Brook University. Okay, I think that's it. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, we want to move right into the the, the crux of the of the um, presentation. And Bob, I want to ask you to kind of cover several areas. And I know you like to roll right through this, but if you could give us a quick overview of the project, how it's organized, uh, some discussion around how the economists and the VR professionals work together, and what's been the most important outcome of this collaboration. That's what we call the multi question. <laughs> <laughs> but if you could uh, kind of give us a rundown overview, we'd appreciate it. So, right. Bob. And I, I would call it a brief rest. <laughs> so, uh, here goes. The, this, the project that we have now, the grant we have by the DRIP, is actually the second grant that we received from Nidler. The first grant was essentially to, it was, it was kind of a proof of concept sort of an idea. So in that grant, we developed uh, a model, an estimation model to, the, that was both rigorous, uh, estimable, hopefully produces interpretable and useful results for the VR community. So that, that was that, that worked pretty well in that we had three agencies who partnered with us, actually three states and four agencies that partnered with us. And three of those states are still with us, so you'll hear about them in a second. The second grant now is a five-year grant. It, it's, the idea here is, so let's talk through some of these things. All right, so what we are trying to do is estimate, and in this grant, we refine the ROI model for estimating ROI and service impacts, and we'll talk about those in, in, a, in just a second. We're partnering this time with nine agencies from seven different states. And I'm gonna do them a little different order than they're listed up here. Delaware, the first state, is has two agencies. They have a general agency and an agency for the blind, right? We're working with the general agency. Two other states up here have two agencies. They are uh, North Carolina and Virginia. And we are working with both agencies in both of those states. Okay. The rest of them have combined agencies, and those agencies are Kentucky, Maryland, Oklahoma from the earlier one, we're still working with them a little bit, and Texas. So we're working with a variety of states, from very small, uh, the state of Delaware and their agency, to very large, state of Texas. They're also very, fairly heterogeneous in the way they're, they're organized, the agencies are organized, and they have a certain geographical footprint, but it doesn't extend much beyond the Mississippi. So we don't have any western part of the country in this thing. The, we're using, what we do is we collect data on applicant cohorts, and the reason for that is if you look at an applicant rather than a closure court, which had been kind of the traditional way that, that these were looked at, is what you're dealing with now are people who come in under a similar economic climate, a similar institutional climate. That means they have a similar sort of thought process as they, they work with their counselor and they work through the program and setting up a plan for employment, including the services and that thing. So it, the, kind of, it, the behavioral aspects of it, they're operating under the same sort of constraints and that, that makes things useful. So what we're doing is we have a group of, of clients, what we call a cohort, of applicants in 2000, another group of applicants in 2007, and another one in 2012. Now, as an indication of the variety of, of things that affect that, the 2012 cohort, right, that was, or 2007 cohort, rather, these people came in 2007 when the economy was riding high, and just about the time they were closing out into and trying to get for jobs, we had the financial crisis that led into the Great Recession. So that's a very different economic climate, one that we had to you know, take the model and control, control for appropriately. 
We also have, we sometimes estimate what we call low incidence disabilities. That is uh, disabilities in which there are not many clients. One of those might be autism spectrum disorder, although that might increase in the future. Another is folks with blindness or vision impairments. Now, the way we approach this, we need pretty large samples. And those samples, if you look at a single year from a single agency, it's probably too small for our model to get reliable, rigorous results from it. Therefore, what we do also, you can see here, is we ask for some agents who are willing to give us six years of, of applicant cohort, and then we combine that for low instance, but focus on a year if the cohort's large enough. Right. The other key thing about this is that we use readily available administrative data so that what we're trying to do here is make it as easy as possible for the agencies to, to cooperate with us and low cost as possible. We try to support them where necessary in collecting data. So most of this uh, are data that are collected for reports required by the federal government, in particular the RSA 911, the RSA 2, those things. So they're already collecting these things. They're available generally in some sort of database management system. And they're, they're consistent across agencies, the definitions. So it provides us a rich data set. I think we're ready to move on. Okay. I could probably do it from here. I got you. No. Uh, did I go too far? I think I went too far, didn't I? Can you go back one? Okay, so here we are. Uh, and what we're attempting to do is generate estimates of the impact of specific types of VR services on VR applicants in the long term. So there is a lot. Of, there are a lot of things on this that I should probably talk about. All right. Number one, and let's start with a little looking backwards a little bit. Traditionally, the way kind of impact estimates or outcomes studies traditionally have been looked at with what we think of as kind of a generic client for a generic service, right? That is for a long, long time, the way these sorts of studies would, would look at is they would work with a group of people who either applied to or closed from VR in a specific period, time period. And what they would do is you look at people who received substantive services versus people who did not. So you'd have some sort of comparison group. And when we say a generic service, we're saying they receive services of any variety of types. We don't really know. We don't really track that. They just receive substantive services. That's a generic service. And a generic type, a lot of these studies did not really look at different disabilities. So different disabilities, you might imagine, get a different array of service treatments, they have different plans, and they have potentially different outcomes in the labor market, but they're kind of treated as a generic sort of a client. Another thing that, that for a long, long time would, would go on is the RSA 911 collected information on application regarding earnings. Did you work, and if so, how much would you do you earn in a certain period of time. And then collected that again at closure, like how much did you earn the two weeks before closure, if you're employed and where were you employed, information like that. And then they would kind of take that difference for people who receive substance services, people who did not, and extrapolate. Okay, that's right, and make conclusions on that. Well, there's several things about this that we changed. More recently, of course, with WEO and the new service suite, it goes a little bit longer, you go for about a year after you come back within a year of closure. So that's a little bit longer, but still, we weren't quite sure it was long enough. Right? So here's what we do. First of all, and I'm kind of skipping the second bullet point and then we'll come back. We separate this, we estimate annual rates of return and service impacts, and we look at them for specific disability types. The ones we've been looking at in particular are folks with a mental illness, so that group of people, Folks with a cognitive impairment, that could be a learning disability or an intellectual disability. And folks with physical disabilities, that could be internal or musculoskeletal. So, so we look at those three separately. And we look at those separately within an agency and across agencies. I'm not used to a microphone. Okay. Separately within agencies and across agencies. So there's a lot of estimation that goes on. Now, 
in the first bullet point, jumping back there for a second, what it says is that we look at, instead of looking at the week of application and the week or two weeks at closure or a year within after closure, we take a longer time span. And what we do with that is we try to look at a period two to three years before application, that's sort of a baseline, and then you can compare post-application, post-service thing, you can compare to that and say, what's the difference? So that's a baseline, two to three years before, but it's a longer period of time, right? And then we try to look for at least five or more, maybe 10 years of data afterwards. Now these data, when we ask for, for data and cooperation from an agency, these data are collected generally from whoever collects unemployment inf insurance information for the, for the state. And so when we ask the agency to cooperate with us, we ask for things that they collect and maybe to reach out to their UI partner in the state and collect that sort of information. And, and also to help kind of cooperate, we know that, that in some states, uh, those agencies charge for that data. And so we built some money in from the very get-go, from the beginning, to help defray those expenses for the partner agencies. Okay. And the last thing is, instead of one generic service, we do what we call cracking the black box of services, of VR services. And what we've done is we've worked with agencies over time and identified between seven to nine types of services broadly that seem to make sense. So one would be kind of assessment, even diagnostic evaluation, some training might be in there, some, some maintenance, some things of these sort. For folks who are blind or vision impaired, you might also talk about orientation mobility, assistive technology. So service that makes sense. And what we do then is we get separate impacts by type of service, type of, of disability, and agency. And so you get a, a wide variety, you get quite a, quite a deep and good look into this, okay? Uh, and there's also one more thing. If you wanna get into this a little more detail, we have a, a resource tab on our project, web project, vroi.org. Okay, next slide. Uh, next slide. Oh, yeah, it's up there, okay. Now, what we did from the very beginning and one of the key takeaways that, that Rick asked about is we tried to have ongoing engagement with our partner agency. That is, keep them engaged. We said that we wanted to develop rigorous, interpretable, and useful information. And the only way you can do that is by working with our partner agency as closely as, as you could. So we have an ongoing engagement. Now, let me tell you how this works. So it says to develop, implement, refine the project and its intended projects. So when we work with, with a partner agency, the first thing we do is we make a trip, three or four or five of us, and maybe one or two people on the phone, make a trip to the agency. And the purpose of that are three or four fold. The first purpose for this is to kind of run through our approach, our model, and some example results that we found in the past. So people can, can kind of understand our approach and our mentality, and then ask questions about how that works. That's the first thing we do. And the second point of that is, we'd like to learn more about the specific institutional nature of the agency. We want to learn more, more about the agency itself. Because to a certain extent, we have this broad approach to it, but we can tweak it, we can customize it for specific agents for something that's a little different that makes a, could make a pretty big difference. So we wanna learn more and more about specifics of that agency. A third reason for it is that one thing we know about VR is that it is very cooperative between the client, the participant, and the counselor, right? They have a mutual understanding, they come to a mutual agreement about a plan for employment, a service regimen, and we wanna know more about how that works. So we then, after we ask them, how does that work with this? Because that's very important in our model. We take advantage of that specific feature in our model. It's, it's one of the key things that make it work. So we need to know how that works with them, okay? 
Now, another thing it says is ensure the validity of the results. That's the first thing. We make a trip out. Then the next step, of course, is working with the agency to collect the data. We put the data in. We get descriptive statistics, a little bit learn some things about it, maybe by the three different disability types, the type of services they receive. And while we're doing that, and some other things, while we're doing that, sometimes we see some things that kind of raise a question. We don't quite understand. This looks a little different from what we've seen in the past. So we want to we wanted to see, do these pass the smell test? Do we have it right? Do we have any data problems, big data problems? Uh, is, what explains some of these things? So what we'll then often do is have a, a conference call with the agencies and run through some things and say, is there anything here that seems odd to you that the, given your background, your knowledge, that we don't have right? If so, let, let's try to get that figured out and fixed. Or is there anything you could explain to flesh out some questions that it came up in our mind. Again, that's a smell test sort of thing. Then the next step, of course, is to run it through our model, clean that up, get that organized, and then make the estimates. And then we might probably make another trip to the agency and run these by. And again, it's another check. Another, does this pass smell? Does this stuff make sense? This result looks a little odd to us. Is there a reason why that might be, or is that we missing something? What, what's going on here? So all of these are, again, that rigor part. Do we, are we getting it right? No. Uh, I think that should, should about do it. Okay. Thank you so much, Bob. Having gone through this process with this team over 10 years, uh, I'm now 58 years old, getting older, watch less television, but I'm still hooked on the History Channel where they actually renovate and restore an old car in like 30 minutes. Well, if you've ever done that, like my dad does, it takes several years, and these guys can do it in 30 minutes. So you're getting the really the overview of lots of years of work and having sat through a lot of these meetings where we have those conversations and dissect the data and reflect on it and begin to see these realizations it's exciting to see you be able to present that in such a compacted time frame but we're literally talking about years of work to get to this deeper understanding so the the work that you and this team has done really is uh, phenomenal i'd like to ask uh, kirsten rowe uh dr kirsten rowe if she'd come up to the uh you want to go from the podium or are you going to stay seated i will come to the podium she's gonna she's gonna make it over to the podium uh dr uh, rowe has been with this project for many years she is a vr professional in her own right in so many different ways and has been an inspiration to me uh as a person who's worked in vr for several decades uh and it's nice to welcome her uh kirsten what was the significance of the collaboration between the voc rehab professionals and the research economists from your perspective having gone through this process? Well, it, it was several fold. Um, certainly, as Bob alluded to, so there's been more than one grant. There was initial three-year FIP as well as this current uh, DRIP, which is um, in the fifth of what will be six years. <laughs> um, we're going to continue into next year for sure. Um, and this project has been a true collaboration between VR and, and labor economics researchers since the very beginning. Our agency, our, Joe and I, um, Dr. Ashley and I, were involved as VR professionals in the Virginia agency in the development of the four uh, grant applications that finally led to an award. Um, and, and we were equal partners. We helped define the, um, the research questions. We helped determine um, what the objectives of the projects have been. We have been integrally involved in working with the, the research team Team and with folks in the other states to um, help this project make sense and help work through the challenges of acquiring the data and making use of the data and making sense of the data. So it really has been a, a collaborative endeavor from the outset. Um, 
although Joe is now in a private consultant role, um, he came into this, this five-year drip as the co-principal investigator. And, and that for us has said a lot about this, the nature of this collaboration. Um, Joe has been an equal partner with Bob in determining a variety of, of things about the direction of the project and the focus of it throughout its, its life. Um, and, um, and has been intimately involved in lots of the decisions about the project. Um, Bob alluded to the fact that um, one of the ways that this project has recognized the importance of in including VR as a, as a kind of an equal partner has been uh, through the, the willingness of the of the University of Richmond and the, the team to make grant funds available to help support VR agencies' costs in participating in this project. And for anyone with a VR agency in the audience who's ever participated in a research project, they're exciting, there's a lot to learn, and they cost. They cost time, they cost effort, and in the case of acquiring the unemployment insurance program data, at least in Virginia, they cost money. Um, and being part of the process, among other things, of deciding how grant funds were going to be allocated and having the explicit recognition that sometimes yeah, a, a, a grant funded project, a research project has to, to support some of those agency costs um, was a big deal for us. It, it again reinforced the idea that we were partners. Um, one of the, I think one of the kind of critical things about this project that has made um, made it so useful to, to the VR agencies and to, so useful to VR in general is that unlike many other kinds of research projects, and, and Virginia VR has been involved in a number over the years, this one is about VR itself. A number of other research projects we have been involved in and are involved in now are about layering something up on top, uh, it, you know, a new promising intervention, a new promising practice, and studying the impact of this new promising intervention or promising practice as compared with VR business as usual, and VR business as usual ends up being the, the black box, the generic service. Um, it's the new promising practice or intervention that's the focus of the research. Well, in contrast, the researchers on this project really needed to understand VR. Their model depended on them understanding VR, and they they have worked really hard. They, they ask us really good questions all the time about how decisions are made, when policies change, what the processes are for making decisions about services, um, how order of selection work. I mean, they, they understand a lot of things about how VR works as a result of the work that they have needed to do to make sure that their model reflects the reality of how VR works. And, and so it really has needed to be a partnership where we have certain expertise, they have certain expertise, and it's the combined expertise that makes it so useful um, because it really is about VR and how VR works and what its long-term impacts are. Um, it, we also, since the, the current DRIP, the current Disability and Rehabilitation Research Program grant, um, also has a, a, a knowledge translation or dissemination component, one of the things that we've been integrally involved in since the beginning is, okay, so how do we take this really fascinating rich research information and translate it into stuff that makes sense to VR folks, um, makes sense to VR administrators, makes sense to VR program managers, makes sense to VR field staff, and even makes sense to uh, um, VR program participants and to our state rehabilitation councils. The fact that, again, we were involved in making decisions about how to operate this project meant that there was always attention to those kinds of questions and people with, with knowledge and background and expertise in VR to help to help inform the decision making about that. And this one has truly been unique in my experience with VR in the sense that it has been an absolutely integral partnership throughout its its lifespan.
you've alluded to how we engage in these challenging conversations. There's a lot of discussion and we are tackling these challenging problems. As you've worked your way through this process, any aha moments? Well, actually, yeah. One of one of our early activities in the project um, involved going to a, a CSABR meeting to describe what the project was about as a, as a way of providing early information. This was before results were available um, from the project itself. But here's the project. Here's the model. Here's the approach. Um, and one of the people in the room, and I can't remember what state they were from. Um, yeah, you don't. Yeah, neither Joe nor I remember. One of the states with those great rehabilitation counselors and statisticians. <laughs> yes, yes, one, yes, one of those fabulous states. Those great places. So we were sitting at a at a at a table having a discussion about this this new project, and and um, the person representing State X um, said, "Wow, sounds like this kind of information could be really useful for." the informed choice process, because if you're able to get information about how this, you know, um, particular type of service, how post-secondary education has this incredibly positive impact for people with cognitive impairments, um, and um, that if you if you receive that kind of a service, well, then you're likely to have better um, stability and employment and better long term earnings. And you can clearly attribute that result to the impact of VR rather than other factors. And that's one of the big things about this model that makes it so strong is they do a really rigorous job of being able to say, yes, this impact is due to VR. Well, isn't that useful information for program participants themselves as they're deciding what kinds of services they want, what career goals they have, what, what options might be available. If they know that particular kinds of services um, are likely to have a better impact for them in the long run, isn't that going to be useful? Well, we had frankly never thought about it that way up to that point. But it has that potential because it, it is such a rich set of information and is very refined in terms of being able to speak to different kinds of impacts for different kinds of people in different programs in different states. Um, and that was a, a, a really big aha for, for both Joe and me when we attended this. And we've been, been continuing to think about and pay attention to that as this project has evolved. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Joe Ashley is going to join us at the podium. Joe is the king of the one-liner. Uh, one-liners like uh, helping uh, consumers find an edge and other great comments that he's come up uh, with through the years. Uh, I have heard him say in this process uh, that he likes to create stakeholder involvement early and often. And I think he's credited with saying that. So, Joe, uh, how has this been part of the process? Project, and what is the significance of the stakeholder involvement is, as you like to say, early and often? Well, uh, I, will, I just want to first say, Rick, um, to our friends at, well, this is bizarre. I have a phone call coming in. <laughs> Let me see if I can. Ladies and gentlemen, please pause momentarily while Dr. Ashley answers his Dr. telephone. Ashley gets phone calls. <laughs> this must be important. No, it must be terrible. <laughs> okay. Yeah, you good wait. to go there? We need to take a pause. We can move no, forward no, if you good. want. Um, where was? Oh yes, I want to. Excuse me for that. Early and often. Early and often. Stakeholder I involvement. And uh, you know, earlier I reacted much better when I spilled the water on me. Just a second ago. Um, I, I love like working with this guy. I really do. <laughs> I would say that um, I want to thank our friends from the Center for Knowledge Translation and Employment Research for inviting us to participate in the track you have here on uh, State of the Science. We do really uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here and thank you for that invite. I would say the early and often is sort of how we built into the program the opportunity to have stakeholder involvement. And by that we mean the people who, the agencies that participated with us on the model and other people who have stakes in the VR process, including staff. 
as Bob pointed out, we've spent a lot of time going out and talking to our participants, and we'll talk a little bit about that as a part of the model. We created some opportunities for structured focus groups, engagement with various stakeholders, and we also have taken advantage of ad hoc opportunities as they came up. Another key component to this particular project has been our advisory committee and the robustness of that committee, which I'll also speak to here in just a second. But it doesn't get much earlier in terms of engagement than we got the grant in October and by October 30th or the 1st of November of that same year, we were invited to come to Nidler at the request of the, de uh, the Director of Research and uh, the, CS the RSA Commissioner to discuss this model project and the approach we were taking. So we went up to DC and had an opportunity to talk with uh, invited staff from those two groups. And it was in very instructive because we went through the model and we had some great requests for can your model research these questions and they were all great questions. But one of the things that as Bob mentioned when he went through the process is our model builds specifically on readily available administrative data. And we obviously hadn't made that clear enough because none of the questions that we received uh, far none of the questions we received were there any readily available administrative data. So we learned two things in that particular meeting and one was that we needed to think about how we presented the innovations that we saw in our model and be clearer with them and the second was we learned some information that if we could find some data we would include those questions in what we were looking at. We also included some focus groups where we had professional facilitator, a professional facilitator come in and we went to the CSAVR meeting in Bethesda and invited agency heads from other than our four model states. This was during the FIP. And we also took advantage of the CSAVR opportunity. So not only did we have other rehabilitation agencies, we had CSAVR involvement. We had the National Council for Administrators of Blind Services in representation. We had the State Rehabilitation Council members participating with us in that discussion. And uh, thanks to our colleagues at GW, we were able to get some Tay Center directors back in the day uh, to participate with us. And we asked them basically, uh, here's the model, is there a better way to explain it? Or what do we need to clarify so that people can understand what it is we're proposing? Because we were, we were not clear that we were getting the point across when we were talking to folks about the innovations. And they were very helpful in helping us figure out what we needed to put out in information. The other thing we learned in this process was how agency heads were thinking about using the information. They said, if you, we'd really like to have something concise that we could share with the policy makers to whom we report. And that was critical to us to think about how to do that. And then our friends from the taste centers were talking about how the information should be thought of when we were looking at taking it to VR staff. We, uh, we followed that up with a meeting at the National Rehabilitation Association where we invited people to participate in another facilitated focus group and similar kinds of questions. And we were trying to get down to people who were more direct service level or supervisors so that we could see, does this model make sense to you? What do we need to clarify? And then also, how would you use this information? And it was from that start and then the meeting that Kirsten so eloquently described a second ago, that we decided maybe there is something here we need to be thinking about for helping counselors with client choice. So it, it sort of expanded our thinking on the process. So we were building in this opportunity for discussion, for people having input into what we were doing. Another piece that was critical in this process is our advisory committee. Uh, every agency head and any of the, uh, where we have the model agencies participating with this is a member of the group. Uh, they often bring key staff that they believe need to participate with them in that discussion or to hear the discussions. We had a, an outside economist from Mathematica who participated so that we had another uh, ec economics perspective being discussed. We had CSAVR and NCSAB representation uh, with us in that particular room. We also had State Rehabilitation Council representation and from Virginia we had 
uh, basically a, com a community rehab program steering committee that had a representative that would participate. And we had a, a chief workforce advisor in Virginia participating because we wanted a broader WIOA perspective on the drip when we got down to that. This group often saw data in preliminarily and had discussions with the economists that Bob was describing and Kirsten was describing about how to clarify the model. Uh, we're, this is what we're observing. What does this mean to you all? And they began to learn the variability of VR services across states, and that was key to them. The other thing that we would say is, here's what we're seeing, does this make sense to you? I mean, that, that came up a lot, and we used it was used to refine the model and trying to develop these instrumental variables so that we could definitely make sure that whatever results that we said uh, had were the result of the VR intervention and not other factors, and that became sort of a mantra. The other thing the advisory committee was very helpful in was saying you really need to figure out how to get this to counselors and other staff so that if you have this information, maybe Maybe we could use it for program improvement. Maybe we could use it to help with client choice as we began to get a more refined model. I will say in the in our drip, we had heard this enough uh, from the advisory committee before them that we approached our colleagues at GW, and you're going to hear about some of the work they've been doing that is just stellar. And what we were looking at is people who knew how to take uh, evidence-based practice and put it into uh, something that VR counselors, VR staff could use in their day-to-day -day work or better at least understand how it impacts them and their consumers. So we built that into the model and they came up with the ideas you're gonna hear about on how to implement that. And it's always been something we put in front of the advisory committee to get refinement. So that was huge. Another thing you saw that we did or Bob talked about was going out to the, to each state. We had several meetings with states. Uh, we were trying to point out to them that participating with, with us was in their enlightened self-interest, that it was good for all, and create the buy-in. That was huge because we were gonna ask them for data, we were gonna ask them to do things. So we needed to be sure they understood that this was important to do and it was useful information. And that created a, a really good back and forth with folks. We also went out to, uh, in the early days, to some uh, direct service providers and some supervisors as we were looking at the service mapping, the, the terms, and saying, Does, or, do these groupings make sense? Is this how you do business in your state so that we could monitor by state. Uh, when we went to the blind service agencies, we, as Bob mentioned, we created additional categories for them in the services because that seemed to be where their service uh, mapping took them. So we've been very flexible in this, but it's huge to be able to understand how all this fits together. So that back and forth uh, that we had either through the advisory committee or direct inter, uh, discussions with people doing the work has helped make the model more viable and create a better instrument. Joe, you talked uh, at length about these stakeholder groups, how valuable they were, particularly the one at CSAVR. Uh, anything you'd like to say about how uh, the information that you provided to the VR professionals helped address some of the frequently asked questions? Yeah, I, I would say that uh, getting the information from folks about you need to clarify some of these things, uh, and that process is still ongoing. We're still not quite as clear as we need to be on how we control for selection bias in the as compared to whom question. We're still working on that. But I think that the whole process uh, has led us to creating some things we're going to talk about in a minute, the elevator speech and some other practical applications of the information. You're going to see that. Uh, I would also say one of the things that I think was critical is that when we went out to these places to help clarify, we did a lot of active listening and active learning. And that active learning process that re that uh, resulted in action being taken by the uh, the economists made a huge difference in people's trust of us, um, and that we were respecting their time, so we thought it was important for us. Uh, to be able to show that we had listened and where we couldn't make a change, we explained why. And that kind of interaction, I think, is critical in this process of clarifying. Thank you so much, Joe. We appreciate that. Thanks. Dr. Rob Froelich, uh, George Washington University, if you'd make your way over to the podium.
Always nice to have you on hand to uh, help us develop deeper insights to VR as you've done so many of these settings. Uh, what do you see as some of the critical points and the importance of this uh, knowledge transfer effort? Sure. Thanks for the nice comments, right? You're welcome. So knowledge translation, we knew that this was going to be essential from the very beginning. This topic that we're dealing with, the content of the information, is extremely abstract. And it's really not easy to explain. Would it surprise you um, if I let you in on a little secret that economists speak a different language than vocational rehabilitation? You're kidding me. <laughs> Maybe even a little bit of a different language than uh, counseling education professionals. So in terms of when we use this word, a lot of times translation, we're talking about something that's written in an entirely different language. You could have the best book but it's written in another language and you don't read that language, it's really not of a lot of value to you. And we didn't want to have this big abstraction with all of this work just sitting there. We wanted to make sure that there was some utility and there was gonna be some sort of a way to um, get this, uh, the, the greatest amount of use possible. So knowledge translation was an essential piece of this. And I'm gonna talk about maybe some of the feedback mechanisms that we developed, but I really wanna say knowledge translation is is a focus here, but it's good communication. It's the ability to do a lot of what we've heard back and forth of talking with different groups and saying, what did you hear? And what does that mean to you? And what are your needs? So that's been essential to our work uh, throughout. One of the big mechanisms that we created in order to uh, try to translate some of the, the great um, results and information that my colleagues have created was to create what we call the VR ROI learning community. And the learning community is some similar role, like rolled individuals in all of the states that we work with. In many ways, they have access to the data elements, they're knowledgeable about that, but they're also a line of individuals that are closer to the direct service professionals and have access. We, we've been able to access their time, uh, they've been very generous with us, uh, their talent and their knowledge in order to help us figure there are multiple different messages that have to be used and delivered relative to the results. Different groups are going to need different things. This learning community uh, that meets several times a year um, uh, gives us the opportunity to get greater insight into what are those needs at those multiple different areas. We needed to know what do staff know? What are they interested in? What, what is their understanding of this information? That was essential. Uh, so it was important for us to think about how do we begin introducing this information to different staff, uh, different levels of staff. You don't want to overwhelm people. You don't want them to just sometimes uh, when um, folks are talking about information that has a lot of different uh, tables and charts and uh, different ways to figure out information. You're good for about two minutes and then people glass over. We wanted to figure out, okay, how do we, how do we get there? How do we get the messaging in so that that screen doesn't come down immediately? And again, our, our learning community was very helpful uh, with respect to that. They helped us also figure out ways to describe what it is and what it isn't what it can be used for and what's inappropriate uh, or what would be not so good applications of the information. Um, that kind of led us on a, a, a necessary and important side road, um, but a nice corollary, a nice complement uh, of looking at the ethical use of return on investment data. And what do we do with that? And how do you put context around that? Um, so again, between the advisory council uh, that, that uh, Joe described wonderfully and in detail um, and our learning community, uh, we've been able to um, tailor the messaging in appropriate ways and to make sure that we're using the materials in the right way. Um, our learning community uh, helped uh, bring in some training professionals, some knowledgeable uh, VR professionals, data analysts, evaluation staff, to help and develop some project-related technical uh, uh, training and technical assistance products as well. Um, uh, 
in addition, helps us to get to some of those constituents uh, in more d detail that Joe talked about, the state rehabilitation counselors, the counselors and direct service staff, um, community rehabilitation providers as well. Thank you so much. Sure. Uh, we're down to about 25 minutes left in uh, the presentation, and now one of the sort of the key points is that throughout this process, we realized that there was a need for the elevator speech, and we've all heard about that. Can you describe to someone in 20 seconds what the whole crux of the matter is? And so I'd like to ask Bob and Joe if they would talk uh, briefly about the, uh, the elevator speech, and we'll uh, turn to Bob for the first portion of that. Thank you, Rick. So I think we need a new slide, right? Got it. No, wait a second. This is, is that the way it reads? That's the elevator speech. You need a different one. Is it a good one? No, it's not in a paragraph form. Oh, get me to cite it. For well, all right, it'll it works. Okay. <laughs> so this is why well, it's a bullet point, but the other was a paragraph. Uh, the elevator speech simply says this, and it applied to a group of folks who applied in 2000, year 2000 to Virginia DARS, uh, Department for Aging and Rehabilitation Services. And essentially what happens is, in, when you get to the bottom line, we we'll go through all this stuff, you can summarize the results in a way for state legislature or other folks. For those VR applicants in 2000 who received VR services, 80% enjoyed earnings gains that exceeded the cost of VR. For every $1,000 spent by the Department for Aging and Rehab Service for DARS, the average by which we mean median consumer earned $7,100 more in 10 years than would have been possible without VR services. And the top 10% earned $45,100 or more in the same period. So let me go through it point by point and explain kind of a little bit more about that. So the first point, 80% of folks enjoyed earnings gains that exceeded the cost of VR. Okay, there are a couple of things about this. One is when we first presented this to a group of administrators, senior administrators, one person said, you know, I like that. If you had told me that 100% exceeded, I wouldn't have believed, I wouldn't have had any trust in what you guys were doing, you were rigging the books. Cooking the books, rigging the numbers, I just wouldn't believe it. I believe this. So what it does say is it says that it says that they exceeded the cost. So this does not mean that the other 20% did not have any earnings gains necessarily. It means they might have earnings gains, but they weren't as large as the cost of providing the services. So that's one thing. That's an important thing to remember. Some people didn't have necessarily, didn't have earnings gains compared to people who didn't receive the service. This is all by comparison. Okay. Uh, secondly, this is over a 10 year period. So what, what this says is we kind of look and say over 10 years, this is what the gains would be because all of the costs kind of happen around in a year or so or two. The gains go on hopefully forever, or at least for a long time. So we look over a 10-year period. You could look over a 15 or 20-year period, but you're kind of extrapolating these things, and, and that's what this is, all right? Then secondly, for every $1,000 spent by DARS, the average or median, so the median, so half are below and half are above that, okay? Earn $7,100 or more in 10 years than would be possible. So it's a seven to one ratio, seven to one earnings ratio, earnings to cost. And that's, that's pretty strong, that's good. And this is again through a model that we believe is pretty rigorous. We tested in the academic economic literature to demonstrate the literature uh, in double blind review, pretty strong journals. And we have published about five of those so far, I think five or so of such articles. We're also now working in the VR uh, field in publishing, one of which is we have a special issue coming out in the Journal of Rehabilitation Administration. I believe that'll be coming out hopefully this calendar year or next, that'll be coming out. And it, that has six or seven articles, just kind of a whole thing is dedicated to, to ROI, not VR ROI, not just ours, but just the whole concept. And so that's pretty high. And the last one, $45,100 or more for the top 10%. Now that's just off the charts, right? I mean, that, that's just huge. Yeah. Those numbers reflect employed or 
No, so these, uh, so, no, so. If you would repeat the question. Oh, okay, uh, I'll repeat the question. So the, the question is, this, uh, just look at people employed or just status 26, it's the old status 26, right? So that when we first started this, that's one of the things. So this kind of been a back and forth. Rob says, you, know, you have to educate economists on how to talk. And I'm sort of starting to understand him now, but it's just, it's been an effort. <laughs> but the, uh, when we first look at this, uh, my colleagues and, and economists never really look at much at administrative closure status. Right? What we're interested in, does a person receive services? So these are for people who receive services of a variety of types. Okay. They may be close to status 26, they may be close to status 28, they may be close to status 30, you know, or, or maybe there was, and actually, as you well know, some people who were not accepted into the, into the process or did not complete an IPE, okay? Some of those folks received some services, part of as part of the assessment, but that might or might not have an impact in, in, in the marketplace as well for them, positive or negative, right? So it, it's anybody received service out respect to how successfully they were closed. Okay, all right. Joe, you have some additional comments about how this was developed and some insights into the elevator speech. Yeah, um, I mentioned to you that the focus group in, we did with at CSAVR and then we continually were being asked by the advisory committee who was chaired by my boss at the time saying that we need something that is simple concise and that I can talk to uh, my the secretary or the people to whom they reported or legislators locally and do it in a concise way. So we began working with the economist to come up with a way to say this. Uh, and in the beginning, um, you needed to be on about a 23 story building. So the elevator took some time to get to the bottom because it was a little longer. And is, you know, we're down what, three, four floors now, Bob. So, you know, you've got to be able to get this out quickly in a way, and it's about getting invited back. Bob mentioned the, uh, the, it was a secretary of health and human resources in Virginia where I presented the information that he was just sharing with you. And he said, okay, it's 80%, so not everybody did it, so that's fine. It got us an audience back where he brought a number of people in in the state, including people from the legislature for us to present the findings in more detail. It gave us two hours. So it was a foot in the door way to say, here's what we, here's what VR is doing. And they said, I wanna follow up on that. So that's really the purpose that um, our folks at the advisory committee were looking for with what we now deem the elevator speech. And that's how it came about. That's one of the ways we put things into action from the requests we got from the people who we were participating with. Uh, Joe, before you go, as uh uh, Kirsten makes her way over to the uh, podium. Tell us a little bit about the PERT program. We're going to be talking about that. Tell, tell folks what PERT is. It's the Post-Secondary Education Rehabilitation Transition Project. It was a uh, OSERS developed transition project that started in about 85. It's still ongoing. Uh, it looks at developing career assessment. It's about nine days now of career assessment, also independent living skills assessment and leisure skills assessment. It starts with these people in the school systems with a team from VR in the schools. And those folks go to the Wilson Workforce and Rehabilitation Center. They go through this nine days. They have a consolidated report that goes back to the schools. And the design is for it to flow back and forth with the schools and that the information is used and the career planning information is used. And then the students um, in that process some are followed along to make sure that things are changed over time. And uh, one of your legacies is that program, and certainly you're recognized for uh, the startup and the maintenance of that wonderful program all these years. I know as a director of uh, Wilson Workforce, and I have to say former director since I retired in June, uh, I know the center benefited a lot from the ROI project, uh, presenting information that demonstrated the program effectiveness uh, of that per program. Uh, Kirsten, could you describe uh, the efforts to develop the informational statements and how this became a joint project between the researchers and the PERT staff. 
Sure. Um, and, and first, I'm, I'm just going to describe what those results actually were. Um, so with this post-secondary education rehabilitation transition program, the, the strength and flexibility of this project's approach to estimating the impacts um, of VR and of related programs on uh, long-term employment and earnings enabled the researchers to look at the impact of the PERT program. And what they found was that participation in PERT alone uh, increased participants' uh, likelihood of finding and keeping a job by 12%. And then if students, and it's a program for students, if, if the students stayed in school at least one more year, the um, odds of them getting and keeping a job increased by an additional 38%. And then after finding a job, participating in PERT on average uh, doubled the amount of people's earnings over time. Well, as you can imagine, this is really powerful information for the program staff and for the participants in the program or potential participants in the program for the schools that are also equal partners in the PERT program. Um, the process of getting to this was another, to me, another example of the, of the partnership between the researchers and the VR um, uh, collaborators on this, on this project because it was really important to to the staff of the PERT program, once they heard about these results, they were like, oh my goodness, we have to share this information with our stakeholders, with potential participants. People need to understand that this is a program that can really make a difference. Um, but it was also really important that they didn't overstate the results of the research. The researchers were understandably concerned about making sure that the way program staff were describing the results, not only was supported by the findings, but also didn't over-interpret the findings. So several members of the research team um, who were at that point based in Charlottesville or Richmond, got in the car, drove over to the Wilson Center or across the Blue Ridge Mountains, and spent the a good part of a day hammering out what it would make sense to say that could be said in a way that the average stakeholder, participant, parent, teacher could make sense out of. Um, and that to me is a really sort of classic example of really effective knowledge translation um, that, takes, that takes collaboration and that takes being willing to, to, um, to work together to get to usable information for particular stakeholder groups. Rob, do you have anything to say in terms of that being an ethical use of data? I set it up for you. You set that up nicely <laughs> for me. Absolutely. I mean, that's the whole, like, from start to finish description of looking at what is it, what can you use it for, what should you not use it for. Along those lines, we really um, kind of worked on having a few quick messages too about that whole what it's not used. It's not used to screen people out. It's not used to change the whole concept of vocational rehabil rehabilitation from individualized. It's not to say you have this characteristic and there wasn't such a great return on this. You can never do that. That's not the intent. Um, at all. So yeah, that's a, a nice link in with, yeah. with that particular topic too. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I'm not a data person. I value data. I use data, but I'm the token marketer slash program person that gets invited to a place like this because I enjoy moderating panels. But I can say that when we had the PERT staff engaged in that dialogue, we're talking about a group that works with dormitory and residential students that does life skills programming, vocational evaluation, after evening hours activities. When they heard those statements, they came alive because it wasn't an academic uh, activity that was very heady and that a talking head is going to come in and share with you. They began to see it and they began to quote those statements to parents. When parents would drop their son or daughter off, they could, they could make some sense of what's going on here and share uh, an anecdote or a data point that really uh, many times helped us get mom to the car.
because when they drop their kids off, sometimes it's very separation anxiety. Who's dropped their kids off at college before? Any mom done that? It's a long way back to the car, isn't it? Uh, so that was uh, uh, just a memory of how this really affected uh, our operation. We're going to wrap things up here shortly. We have about nine minutes. Uh, Bob, do you have any closing comments? I'll share the mic. Oh, sure. Yes, I, I would just say that I'm very thankful and appreciative to have been part of this project. It's been very rewarding to us, the interaction between the partner agencies, all, all groups, the economists and things, has been very exciting, and we've learned a lot. It's interesting, but when you kind of step out of your discipline, out of your area expertise, and you learn from other people, and you talk with other people, it you learn a lot. One thing you learn is that you use jargon. <laughs> That's one thing you learn. And then you, you, you also learn maybe how to explain, express the same ideas without using some jargon, right? And I know in teaching for decades that sometimes the questions that students ask is like, now, where did that come from? You know, that, that kind of thing. And there are a couple of ways you can react to that. One you can say is, that's a stupid question, I'm moving on, uh, which is not necessarily appropriate. Uh, a second way is to say, you know, there, there's something here that maybe I don't understand this as well as I, as I thought I did. And you go back and you learn a little bit more. You think about it from a different perspective. And you learn more about it by thinking, taking a different look at it. And that's kind of what's been happening with our economists and my colleagues of that sort of thing. So it's been great. I mean, we love it. Thank you so much. Uh, Joe, any uh, closing comments? To come over to the podium if you want to come there it is. Uh, I would just say that I, I have greatly appreciated working with The Economist. Uh, their drive to learn how VR works has been critical to the success of us being able to capture information on VR outcomes. And their commitment to making sure it's as accurate as possible has been, in my case, I, I'll use the word fun to watch. It's, it's been serious and it's been uh, quite the experience. Thank you so much. Rob, Kirsten? Closing comments? Kirsten's going to pass. Rob's coming over. Just, just, just one thing, too. And, and we, we mentioned when we were talking about the, uh, the learning community and how it's been useful and effective in developing some things. But I neglected to kind of mention uh, that there are a few resources on our website at vroi.org, um, including a, a, a series of modules that were developed by the in collaboration with the learning community, but with a lot of feedback and refinement from the learning community. And those modules are really some basic information about the concept of return on investment, some information about our project, uh, but some just basic information that may be helpful to you or some of your colleagues or uh, anybody in your your circle of uh, uh, influence. So vroi.org, um, uh, feel free to go, take a look at those, and um, hope they're helpful to some folks. We're going to, uh, to finish up here. Uh, we have a couple of more things we want to do, but are there, uh, we have time for one question, if anyone has, has a question. Yes, sir. Where do they start and stop? Yeah. Let me uh, do my best to capture that very eloquent question. Where where do you begin and where do you end an ROI study and, and what do you attribute it to? Uh, I'll turn that over to you. The as we've mentioned several times, we're only able to use administratively available data, right? So that what that means is we're only able to use employment and earnings data. That that's it. Now we understand, we realize that there's many more benefits to VR services in the program than simply that. There is, I mean, you you mentioned several of them, but one thing they're just independent living skills, just uh, joy of life, just the satisfaction from doing it. Uh, other people have mentioned uh, 
if it might or might not reduce uh, uh, criminal jail rates sort of thing. You know, that that's all these sorts of things. There are a lot of things. So what you can look at these things are is kind of a baseline minimum, you know, and that there are some other additional, there are some benefits above and beyond that. And we did have uh, one of the researchers and individuals involved in this that passed away. And I'll, I'll ask you if you would just mention uh, David Dean. Yeah, so a colleague of ours, and especially mine, uh, David Dean, who you might or might not know, worked in this area of economics and disabilities, he called it, for 40 years since his grad school days at Rutgers with uh, someone who was uh, kind of a pioneer in, in the field by the name of Monroe Berkowitz at Rutgers. And he passed away very young in 2013. We, he worked with my colleagues at Virginia Dars for 25 years. He got me interested in economics disability. I had never worked in this area before that. And he just, I thought he, he deserved a mention. He died too young. He certainly leaves a, a lasting legacy uh, because of the, the work that he did. Uh, as we finish up, I have about a two-minute piece that we're going to play. Feel free to exit, but please don't. Uh, this is a little two-minute introduction to the podcast featuring some familiar voices while you fill out your evaluations. Please stop by and uh, give us any questions. And to my audio friends in the back, I did plug up the earphone cable, and hopefully this will come through. But this is just a little uh, introduction to uh, our podcast. Give us just a few minutes, and we'll take you on the journey of a lifetime. You know, it startled me, so I went to run. I tripped on one of the strings that was on it, lost my balance, and fell 25 feet off the loft head first. And I landed on concrete and boards. A disability can strike like lightning and in the twinkling of an eye change your life forever. In the United States alone, there are over 60 million people with a disability. So chances are you know, work with, or love someone with a disability. A disability can alter your life even when you're pursuing your most deeply held passions. I had a couple things that day telling me not to race. Every medical professional who has seen the video, they ask the same three questions. One, how am I alive? Two, how did I not end up with a cervical level injury? And three, how did I not end up with a severe brain injury? People with disabilities have proven time and time again to be some of the most resilient, talented, and capable people on earth. And employers are beginning to recognize the passion, energy, and dedication that individuals with disabilities are bringing into the workplace. Rod's been with us for a long period of time. It's a return on investment. That's the pure and simple business angle of it. But beyond that, he teaches, he trains, he's a subject matter expert. So being able to access all that eight, nine, 10 hours a day is is, is quite frankly in our best interest. That's why we've opened up the VR Workforce Studio, a place where we can all celebrate the courageous stories of vocational rehabilitation. Stories from those on the journey. And, and I broke down because, you know, that was the day that I knew I was going to be up, that I was going to get back up and get walking. Stories about the champions of business and industry that hire individuals with disabilities. Oh, it's the best company I've worked for. Uh, they're very professional. They're very nice. It's like a, the company is like a big family. Reflections from the professionals that have dedicated their lives and careers to helping individuals with disabilities go to work. Working with the students closely to see them uh, come in and, and think that, oh, I don't know if I can do this, and provide support for them to where they are empowered and they are achieving their goals and just to see their confidence. Now you can be part of this exciting podcast revolution. Welcome to the community of people who want to champion the causes of disability employment. Diving down into your own personal hells and then coming out of that hell with a smile on your face, but with bumps and bruises in the process and you can walk away smiling and feeling proud of those bruises you know every time you know my son drives off to work i mean i just it just i just feel so good about what it is that you nice folks prepared him for getting people back to life and back to work these powerful stories as told by those on the journey are just a click away on your computer your cell phone 
or mobile device. That's awesome. I think what you're doing is really kind of kind of unique. And you know, we're we're in a, a, a period where people can get information from lots of different sources. And I'm just trying to make people aware of that. I thank you guys for what you're doing. Join us for a new and exciting episode of the VR Workforce Studio Podcast every month at vrworkforcestudio.com or subscribe at Stitcher Radio or in iTunes. Thank you so much for coming out this afternoon. Have a great afternoon.